if my objective is to build muscle or lose fat, my objective in training then should be to create the greatest amount of muscular stimulus with the least amount of systemic stress. Mm. So I don't want to have to do tons of volume. I don't have to do tons of work. I want to do the smallest amount to elicit this muscular building response. Hey, Mike Matthews here from Muscle for Life and Legion Athletics, and welcome to another episode of the Muscle for Life podcast. This time, we are going to be talking about bodybuilding, the sport of bodybuilding, which is a rather strange one that requires a special level and a special type of masochism. If you want to make it to the big leagues in bodybuilding, you not only need great genetics, but you also have to micromanage your nutrition. You have to beat the shit out of your body with absurd amounts of training. And of course, you have to do enough drugs to make Jordan Belfort blush. And it's also a, a rather lonely sport. It makes for a rather isolated and lonely life spent mostly in the gym grinding away to add that next pound of muscle. And even when you make it to the professional level, it really doesn't pay all that well. And so I've often wondered why people do it. Why do they choose to become bodybuilders? And what is it really like to dedicate yourself and dedicate your life to the sport? And a couple of months ago, I was invited to attend a podcasting event put on by my buddies over at Mind Pump Media. Shout out, shout out. Thank you guys. And there I interviewed the ex-pro bodybuilder Ben Pekulski. Now, in case you are not familiar with Ben, he was an Olympia level bodybuilder and he used to step on stage at like 280 pounds and walk around in the low 300s during the off season. And in this interview that I did with him, I got to ask him about what that was like, what that experience and that lifestyle was really like, and how the transition out of the sport has been for him, both physically and psychologically. And as you are going to hear, Ben also just shares some great training advice too, including his favorite exercises for developing different muscle groups, observations on the relationship between volume and intensity and muscle growth, how stress affects your ability to gain muscle and what to do about it and more. This is where I would normally plug a sponsor to pay the bills, but I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in. So instead, I'm just going to quickly tell you about something of mine, specifically my fitness book for men, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. Now this book has sold over 350,000 copies in the last several years and helped thousands and thousands of guys build their best bodies ever, which is why it currently has over 3,100 reviews on Amazon with a four and a half star average. So if you wanna know the biggest lies and myths that are keeping you from achieving the lean, muscular, strong, and healthy body that you truly desire, and if you wanna learn the simple science of building the ultimate male body, then you want to read Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, which you can find on all major online retailers like Amazon, Audible, iTunes, Kobo, and Google Play. Now, speaking of Audible, I should also mention that you can get the audiobook 100% free when you sign up for an Audible account, which I highly recommend that you do if you're not currently listening to audiobooks. I love them myself because they let me make the time that I spend doing stuff like commuting, prepping food, walking my dog, and so forth, so much more valuable and productive. So if you want to take Audible up on this offer and get my book for free, then simply go to www.bitly, B-I-T-L-Y dot com slash free BLS. And that will take you to Audible. And then you just click the sign up today and save button, create your account and voila, you get to listen to Bigger, Leaner, Stronger for free. All righty, that is enough shameless plugging for now at least. Let's get to the show. So yeah, I want to hear about your book. So you were telling me. Yeah. So, um, you know, for 20 years, I was 100% focused, like single-mindedly laser focused on becoming the best bodybuilder in the world, you know, effectively the biggest human being on the planet was kind of the framing in my mind. 
along the way, you run into a lot of roadblocks. You know, you learn a lot of things that do not work, but most importantly, you learn what does work. Mm. And I really think there's there's value in people to understand, like, even though you don't want to look like that, and, you know, I don't even want to look like that anymore. Mm. The, the people who learn the most are the, people, are the people who are always pushing the envelope. Like, I think I had a credible opportunity because I was literally pushing the boundaries of human performance. Yeah. You know, I was pushing harder than anybody and I knew where the line was. I knew where it was going to, where I could toe the line. I knew where if I went a little further, it was going to break. And I pushed frequency and volume. I pushed volume of training. I pushed um, every aspect of like, how hard can I push this thing a little bit further to see, you know, how far can we push that line? How far, how far can we push that line? You know, at one point I was 318 pounds wow. uh, and lean, you know, full eight pack. Like I wasn't fat by any stretch. And, uh, you know, to get that big, you know, that is huge. Not that I advocate that, <laughs> but at the time it, it wasn't even a How much do you weigh right now? 265, 260. Wow. But I mean, so down almost 50 pounds, yeah. but still on my way down. I'm still big, but like this is two years of literally trying to get all this tissue off that I've accumulated for the last 20 years, you know, eating much less, uh, training much less, doing mm. more cardio, doing more, um, you know, parasympathetic activities, like mm. meditation, yoga. Mm. So it's a completely different thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed that I had a shift in my life uh, that allowed me to leave bodybuilding because I was so single-mindedly focused on that that um, I think I probably would have accomplished my goal of being Mr. Olympia and probably had a lot of negative side effects to deal with after mm. the fact because I didn't build muscle easily. And that was my... Why did you decide to stop? Children. I had kids. Uh. Yeah. My, my son was a nudge and my daughter was a punch in the nose. Okay. Yeah, both within 18 months of each other. I'm so blessed for them, man. Like, I couldn't be more grateful. But, you know, I had one kid, and I was like, oh, you know, I can still keep going. And then my daughter came, and I was like, no, I can't. I can't. You can't be a selfish person. Like, bodybuilding is selfish. Any any athlete, anyone who wants to be the best in the world, you have to be selfish. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't be balanced. You Absolutely. Talk about balance, it doesn't exist. Like, you have to have single-minded, focused, and if anyone gets in your way, you squash them. <laughs> they're not yeah, or they're out of your life. life. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I'm very blessed that I was so blessed by God or whatever to, to allow me to have that awakening because it was literally that. I was asleep for 15 years with these blinders on to try to become the biggest human being on the planet. And as I say, I didn't have genetics for building tremendous amount of muscle. I mm. didn't have genetics to be lean. I was a good athlete as a kid, but I was never very muscular. It was actually, it's funny. I was talking about this yesterday. I have journals from when I was 15 years old. I, I, I was religious with my journals all through my teenage years and twenties. That must be interesting to look back. <laughs> well, it's interesting when you see me at 154 pounds and 13 and a half inch arms and people are like, what? I'm like, yeah, like, that's where I started. 15 years old, 155, yeah. 13 and a half inch arms. I think when I saw, I was like 18, I was 155, 160 pounds. Yeah, I, mean, I was I'm, a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a big guy now. I'm only 195 pounds, but right. I started skinny. Yeah, and uh, look, you know, looking back at all that stuff is very interesting to see. And looking at all your trials and tribulations throughout the journey is, um, you know, at the time you're like, gosh, I wish I built muscle as easily as those guys. And you know, and, and I, that's obviously a subjective thing because, you know, I perceived myself to be working really hard, to be really diligent with my sleep, to be really diligent with my nutrition, everything I was, you know, as perfect as I knew how. And the guys I was competing against, at least externally, mm. weren't working as hard, mm. weren't paying as much attention to nutrition. <clears throat> it's like those NFL people. players that like show up with Big Macs and. Yeah, and you know, and it still held true. Wasn't to there? Wasn't there one? I don't really follow football. There's one in the office. They're talking about some guy like that's all he ate, and he was like some super Man, freak. I, I know professional. All he ate was McDonald's. Literally, that's all he ate. Well, so, yeah, you talk about um, what's the fighter from Brazil who literally lived on McDonald's? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the most famous fighter, Silva. Like, Silva. Yes, okay. Anderson Silva. Okay. Uh, lived on McDonald's yeah. like two to three times a day. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm skinny. It's okay. Well, no, that's why your bones break because yeah. you have no density, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, even toward the end of my career, I had, you know, the, the amazing opportunity to travel with the best bodybuilders in the world. And, and even that, like I was the guy who had to pack my meals out there, yeah. to measure my meals. And these guys are eating whatever they want, burger and fries, pizzas yeah. and stuff. And they look better than I do. And I'm working twice as hard. Yeah. That's okay. And, and looking back on it, I think it was my greatest gift mm. because it forced me to search for like what dietarily allows me to. Uh, you know, where can I kind of push it a little bit and still maintain this lean muscular physique? Um, and where can I not get away with these things? And obviously that was very personal to me, but I've also been able to apply those principles to thousands of other people since. Mm. There's so many things along the line there that you identify as this is extremely important in your progress. And mm. this, well, not so much, even though like we talked about just before the, the conversation, there's some things that people put a lot of weight on and they're useless and mm. it'll come out in, you know, years that like, oh, that doesn't do anything. But yeah. Then there's things that I've identified 
because I was pushing the volume and pushing the, you know, the envelope so much yeah. that I've identified like, well, people are going to realize how important that is. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I've been able to help a lot of people since retiring, even before retiring, build a tremendous amount of muscle in a really short amount of time because mm. there's some very, very basic principles. It's not complicated. You know, people complicate exercise because they don't know anything about it. Mm. And I think it has to be this tremendous convoluted number of reps. And or it's, or it's like guruism, right? Where yeah. people... My way is the way. Yeah. So the thing that I teach... And I, uh, and I can't even explain it in a way for, that you can really understand it, but trust me. Yeah. I use a lot of big words. Yeah, exactly. Just, I just know. do what I say that, yeah. I, because it works. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, dude. You know, what I teach is... Quick question is, before you get into that, because yeah. it just it's in my mind. And I hope you don't mind me asking, but how did drugs play a role in that? And the, and the reason why I'm asking is I'm actually genuinely curious because I have you know, being in the fitness space, uh, I myself have never used any drugs. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it, it never really made sense for where I want to be with my body. Sure. And even at this point, even if I wanted to do it, I, I couldn't hide it, so to speak. You right. know what I mean? I've had the same physique more or less for years now, but I've heard that professional bodybuilding is more or less a, it's who can take the most drugs. Yeah, man. Is I, that true? Listen, we can go down that route as long as you want. And I'm, I'll be as transparent as I, as I can. Because you had mentioned, oh, we don't think of it. Because you mentioned, like, okay, so you had to be so diligent with nutrition, you're diligent with everything to make sure that you can stay lean, continue gaining muscle. Right. I know that a lot of people would naively think, well, if you can take enough drugs, doesn't it kind of like doesn't it allow you to just eat the Big Macs and you know not pay that pay that much attention to things? Sure. Bodybuilding in the '70s, '80s, and '90s was a training centric culture. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's a drug centric culture, mm -hmm. and the only variance is. People think that they can take a tremendous amount of drugs and get to where I got. Mm. And the answer is absolutely not. You realize the guys at the top of the world are actually taking so much less than the guys trying to get there because mm. the guys at the top of the world are the ones that respond best to the lowest amount. Mm. So if you go into your doctor right now and you go, doc, I don't feel so good. I have low testosterone. Your doctor's going to give you this reasonable amount of testosterone hormone replacement. And most pro bodybuilders they're taking more than that. There's no question. I took more than that. Right. But it's not as obscene as the internet would have you believe. Mm. Yes, we're augmenting hormones. Mm. No question. But the guys at the top of the sport, most of them, and I can't speak for everybody, most of the ones that I know, get away with using so much less. And that's why they look healthy. They look great. Mm. Though, at least the ones at the top of the sport. Now, mm. there, there's guys that... Did they have to use a lot to get there? And then they were able to taper? No, okay. it, no, it was always, so it is just that biology. It's of, the guys who respond best to the lowest <clears throat> amount. So they're mainly able, able to maintain their health. They're mm -hmm. able, able to maintain the function of their body. Their muscles look healthy. And then you have these other guys who you see, you know, on social media and, you know, at the gym and you're like, Oh, that guy doesn't look very good. Yeah. But yeah, that's because his body's toxic. You know, yeah. he's taking all these ridiculous number of things. He doesn't know what they do, but he heard somewhere on, on, you know, some bodybuilding forum that this was the thing you need to be taking. These guys are not using as much as you think. And the thing that I thought was the most unique identifying factor to all these top guys is they don't lose muscle. So, you know, if you and I stop training for three months, chances are you're not going to look the same. <laughs> chances are I'm not going to look the same. I'm going yeah. to I'm gonna look muscle, I'm gonna lose muscle. I'm going to lose muscle. I'm going to get a bunch of fat. I find with these guys, man, some of them take two to three months off training. Don't eat one to two meals a day. Don't lose any muscle. And wow. there's something to be said there for, you know, the idea of protein breakdown. You know, there's some genetic anomaly there that says, you know, you're just going to maintain all this muscle that you've gained. So that when they get back into training, all of a sudden their body's just fresh and responsive yeah. and they grow. And that is is the unique identifying factor that I saw in a lot of top guys that people just disregard. Like, yes, they gain muscle faster, but they can also go weeks without training or eating and still not lose any muscle. Wow. That's not everybody, but these are the top guys, right? Yeah. So I was very blessed to have great relationships with a lot of guys and... I got to interact with them. I got to literally spend weeks with them on the road or whatever. You see exactly what they're doing. Yeah. You're like, man, you haven't trained in weeks? No. I mean, it's, it takes time off. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, if I do that. Yeah, I'm the guy like waking up in the, every morning yeah. and 200 push-ups because like I got to make sure I'm, yeah. I'm getting my stimulus in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's such an advantage because they can travel around. They can do whatever. And yeah, it's like they can just hit pause. Day. Yeah. You know, like throughout my career, I had five, six meals a day. Otherwise, I was losing weight fast. And granted, I was very heavy. I was very big. But... Um, yeah, I've heard about that. Heard about that. You, so you'd have to bring your food. And let's say if you're if you're going to be in the plane for nine hours, you're flying to Europe. If you didn't eat, would you land lighter? If you if let's say you didn't eat for the, on, on the flight, I, I don't know that I was that. Okay, I, I heard stories of stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but, but I think that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. But I know that if I did it for an extended period of time, okay. like my training would suffer. Yeah, yeah. everything would suffer. So yeah. um, I was very aware of that. But you know, getting back to it, I think um, drugs is certainly a part of the culture. Like, it, unfortunately, it's a part of a lot of professional sports. Of and, you know, looking back on it now, 
knowing what I know now, I would have never done it. But at the time, you know, I was 18 years old and I just decided like, hey, I want to be a professional bodybuilder. I didn't Why? Start. Why did you choose that? I didn't start at 18 years old, but I, I had this this awareness, like this is what I want to do. I think it was because um, I was a very good athlete growing up, but I was terrible at team sports because I was just wasn't a good team player. Mm. Like I'd be like, guys, sit down, I'll do it myself. Like mm. everybody's get out of the way and let me do my thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, bodybuilding was this thing was all on me mm. and, uh, you know, n no one else was responsible for my outcome. And I love that because it was, uh, something I could internalize. I was a very independent kid, you know, mm. from the time I was seven years old, I kind of did my own thing and, and, um, just bodybuilding seemed to fit. I was a very fearful kid. I was very lonely. So bodybuilding was this thing where, um, the muscle allowed me to overcome the fear because oh, I'm going to build this big, strong armor and you're going to fear me mm. rather than me having to fear things around me. And it just allowed me to do it by myself. So there's deeper levels of emotional baggage that are there. And I think most bodybuilders, to be honest, have some emotional baggage um, because why else would anyone want to be that big? You know, looking back on it now, it's like I needed bodybuilding, man, to be mm. honest. Like mm. I needed it. I needed it to, to build my confidence. I needed it to build this armor that would protect me from the world. That what I thought the world was this big, scary place from some things that happened when I was a child. Now it's like, oh, I realize I don't need it anymore. And, and important message for the listeners is, all those things that I thought would change me, meaning develop more self-confidence, overcome fear, you know, make me more attractive to the opposite sex. None of it was true. Maybe from an external perspective, like, oh, this guy's got all these things together for himself. Yeah, but you, you didn't change so much. Man, I, you know, I, I said this before, like I was 293 pounds three or four days out from a contest one time. I was absolutely shredded at 293 pounds and I was the most insecure I ever was because I knew I was being judged and it was a very, very empty place to be, you know, it was a very lonely place to be because you alienate so many people along the way because you're yeah. so single-mindedly focused on, you know, ascending this proverbial mountain that you look back and you go, shit, I'm by myself. I'm, I'm here at the top of the mountain, yeah. you know. I'm in the top like, it doesn't get any better world. than that. Well, I mean, yeah. You're yeah, but you're like, oh man, I just, I neglected all those people. And I love the fact that I was blessed to have that awareness when I got there, you know, and I think it was my children that gave me that awareness. It's like, yeah, great. You can, you can go accomplish this, this uh, superficial goal but it's not going to change the person you are. You know, you have to look so much deeper and uh, look at why you think you need bodybuilding. And then as you start to find that, then you can actually start to become a better human being and, and treat people better. And, and I know they treated people badly, but I was just like, if you're not making me better, you're making me worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, I mean, to kind of sum that up, drugs are a thing, but it's not nearly to the extent that people think. And yes, there are people who are abusing these things, but they're not the people who are at the top of the sport, the people you see. They're the people who are trying to get there, speculating that, oh, these guys at the top of the sport are using this much because that's how they look the way they do. Mm. In reality, it's not true. Mm. Um, the guys at the top of the sport are the guys who are you know, training hard, eating well, and are superior genetically. Yep. And you know, I didn't believe myself to be superior genetically, although, I mean, many people would argue that you got to 318 pounds, you're superior genetically. But I had a lot harder time building muscle than most people did. And uh, like I said, it was, it was a blessing. Mm. Interesting. All right. So let's go back to then what, what <laughs> I, I took us off on a tangent just because mm -hmm. I wanted to get you, I want to get your, you get your thoughts on that. But you were, you were saying earlier that there are some things that you've learned along the way. Um, like I'd be curious as to what do you think in 10 years from now, what are people going to be talking about as this is, this is definitely a thing, things sure. that you, what are some things that you know work yeah. that maybe you couldn't point to scientific research uh, or, or you, well, maybe, maybe it's a, uh, you know what I mean? There's like, yeah, there's no, some side I, I streets. It, man. That, I'm going to pull one step before that and okay. answer that question as well. But I think exercise is convoluted and confused. So people look at exercise and they think that, exercise is the goal and exercise is not the goal. The goal is stimulating your body. The goal is using this external stimulus being the exercise to create an internal response. And if you start to frame it that way, you start to realize that what happens outside of your body is not necessarily the objective. It's to use this thing outside of you to now create that internal response you want. So whether that's an internal response of muscle building or fat loss or, or whatever it is, yeah. um, well, I want this, or a strength adaptation. Well, I want this thing to happen. So the mechanism outside of me is much less relevant. The internal response is what I'm after. Yeah. So people get attached to the mechanism of, of achieving this response, right? They're like, oh, you know, CrossFit's the best way to get lean or, you know, you got to squat to build big legs or you got to yep. do bench press to build a big chest. And all these axioms are ignorant right. and, and I mean, binary thinking is pretty much, is almost always, uh, it should be suspect, I think, right. in anything. Right. So what I teach is, um, you know, it is scientific. I, I teach physics. I teach the physics of exercise and I don't teach it as physics, but I'm like, hey man, this is biomechanics. This is the way your body moves. Now, how do we 
subject your body to forces to make it to adapt because ultimately that's all your body's responding to right yeah. exercise is a means of subjecting your body to external forces to create an internal response so how do we like really narrow this down and simplify the thought process to subject my body to the appropriate amount of force to create this muscular adaptation without exceeding the amount of force because that's either going to do cause negative things as far as injury or it's going to cause negative amounts of excessive stress because we know stress with you look at it like this kill switch for muscle building when we're fat loss right mm. so i need to create the absolute perfect storm of muscular stimulus without exceeding my body's capacity to contract or tolerate the stress that i'm subjecting it to and that sounds abstract, but it's really, really simple. It's like, hey, what does that muscle do and how do I challenge it? It's really that simple. You know, it's like this muscle has two ends. Every muscle in the body has two ends. Right. One end is stabilized. The other one moves closer to it. That's it. And if we could simplify that and minimize all the other things that are happening and forget about what you think is the best way to train that muscle and just literally think yeah. and go, how do I challenge this thing? If I'm trying to challenge my pec, I'm trying to challenge my bicep or my quad, I have to objectively go, okay. What does that muscle do? And now how do I put resistance against that? And how do I make it as hard as I possibly can at every inch or every millimeter of that set of rep rather than objectively attaching to, why well, I got to do a bench press if I want to get a big chest. Who yep. cares? Yep. Bench press is not the goal. It's like getting back more to a first principles. Like, let's just start right. with. And everybody misses that, right? Everybody goes, how many sets and reps do I need, Ben? How many exercises should yeah. I do? Yeah. I said, well, the answer doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, it does matter, but not yet. Yeah. So until I can, can standardize this basic principle of like, one repetition needs to be the same. It needs to be standardized. And then and only then can I actually start to quantify the stimulus, right? So then I can actually learn that manipulating sets, reps, volume, and load matters because I know every rep I've done is exactly the same. And mm -hmm. you know, so many people are, are caught up in periodization and like, oh, should I do more volume, less volume, strength? How, how? Like the answer is when you're training the way most people train with this swinging and, and momentum and so much extraneous movement, it's impossible to know what to do next mm -hmm. because you can't definitively say how much work is being put into that muscle. It's because it's all over the place. This thing gets harder. I use more, I use more momentum. Mm -hmm. I swing things. I use more muscles. So how much actually went into the muscle you're trying to train? I have no idea. So how am I supposed to know if you need more or less, you know, more Different, frequency? Like, who knows? Mm -hmm. So let's start with this foundational thing of like, okay, can I definitively say that the muscle I'm trying to train is actually the thing training at every inch of that rep. It's not just every rep. It's like, I want to know at every inch. And if, and everyone's gone through this and you know what I'm talking about, you're doing lightweights and you're warming up for something. You feel it in the muscle you're trying to train. You start progressing up. You can still feel it. You go a little heavier. Now I don't feel it anymore. Well, you can assume that your body has adapted its position to distribute load to all of the prime movers that are possible, that can possibly move this load. So well, is that what I want? Do I want to move load or do I want to tr challenge a muscle? Because that could be a completely dichotomous objective. Totally. Like if my goal is to move load, that's a different thing. If my goal is to challenge a muscle, well, how do I put this muscle in the greatest position to actually receive the challenge? And uh, That's what I teach, man. It's like you know, this basic principle of learn how to set up. Like learn how to set up to advantage the muscle you're trying to train. Give it the greatest mechanical advantage. What's to, a good to example of that? Uh, bench press. Okay. You, know, you want to do a bench press. And there's a few things that go into a setup, but the first and most important thing is keeping your shoulders back. So as soon as your shoulders come forward, even a millimeter, you're going to lose pec contraction. So mm -hmm. mechanically, if your shoulders are rolled forward in any amount, your pecs can do less work. Uh, spe speaking specific to a press, your pecs can do less work. And I still have 100 pounds in my hand. So here's a thought. I have a 100 pound dumbbell in my hand and my shoulders are retracted as much as I possibly can. My objective should be, well, I want my pec to do 100% of, of the work. Right. It's not possible, right. but we're trying to get as close as we can to that. We have other muscles that can assist. So we have, let's say, front delt, tricep, bicep, lat. We have five muscles that can assist. Objectively, I want the, the pec to do 100% of that. Can't happen, but I should try to get as close to that as I can. So how do I set up to make that the reality? And if my shoulders are retracted, I know that my pecs are going to do a greater percentage of load than if they're rolled forward. And as soon as my pecs start to roll forward, even a little bit, the pec's going to do less work. Therefore, the delt has to do more work. The tricep has to do more work just because it's still this 100 pounds in my hand. So I still have to move that amount of load. So now you're asking more of the other muscles. That may be okay, but if that's your objective, train that objective. You yeah. know, like if I want to train my triceps, I'm going to do a tricep exercise. Yeah. I'm not going and to there do are better, exercise. safer ways to train your shoulders than yeah. to roll them forward and do a bench press. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. So that's the basic premise is like find the easiest mechanical I mean, grip way. width plays into that too then, right? So like... Sure it does. Yeah. And, and you go, if, the closer you go, the more, more it's triceps. And there, yeah, and there's so... And the, exactly. And there's one other level that people don't ever consider, and that's angle. Um, so like the size and orientation of your rib cage plays a big, big role in actually what part of your pec and how much of your pec is going to be mm -hmm. challenged. So, you know, someone who has a more, um, 
you know, if I'm standing something closer to a horizontal sternal angle, and that's not obviously possible to have a horizontal sternal angle, but you have some people who have a very, very vertical sternal angle. So right. someone has a really small rib cage, right. their, their pecs will be very, very vertical. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a lot harder time recruiting their pecs on a bench press or a flat bench or even an incline mm. than someone who has a more kind of horizontal mm. oriented, well, it wouldn't be horizontal, but yeah, yeah, more yeah. closer to, to the area on the side of horizontal. So that's probably the biggest factor. Those two things is, is that sternal angle, the angle of my rib cage and the retraction and, and protraction uh, relative positioning are the biggest considerations and nobody thinks about that stuff, right? So one of the things you get a lot, you get this question all the time too, like what's the best exercise for chest? How many sure. exercises do I need? Yeah. The answer is one, like find the one that actually works well for you. Find the setup that allows you to challenge the pecs to the maximum extent possible in that one exercise. You don't need six exercises yet. So let's master this one. And because I know if I can find one that gets the greatest amount of challenge, the greatest amount of stimulus to the pec, I'm going to get a lot of response. Yeah. So I want to spend the most amount of time learning the skill of exercise. And I think this is what me people miss is they're missing the skill. So if I want to learn to play basketball, I got to learn how to dribble. I can't go and play a game if I don't know how to dribble. I can learn how to dribble with one hand, then the other hand. Then maybe I'll learn how to go between my legs. But it's this, this constant progression that starts with this foundational principle. I got to learn how to dribble. So in, in training, you got to learn how to challenge the muscle. I don't care what exercise you choose. I'm not attached to any, you know, squatting is better than leg presses. It's not. Which one allows me to take this muscle through its full range, allow me to challenge the muscle maximally through its full range. And that's it. That's my objective. So if people can learn that and, you know, think about it like this, if you have a, you know, this kind of circle of comfort, like I want to stay in this little circle where all the exercises that are in that circle are the ones that I'm really, really good at. Like I've picked one exercise or two exercises per body part and I master those. And then slowly we start to introduce exercises that are outside of the circle and bring them in and expand my, my circle. Right. Mm. So we may start with one to two exercises per body part and mm. master those things. And it may take you four weeks. It may take you four months, but master those first. Cause then I know definitively I have something that I can use to challenge my muscles mm. as I slowly then expand my skill set and allow myself to diversify my ability to challenge this muscle. That is the foundation of muscle building. And that's the, the big piece that everybody's missing. As you know, everybody's looking for the miraculous workout program, the sets and rep scheme that's going to change yeah. my life. How many, you know, I need tons of volume. I need high volume, low volume. The answer is you don't have no idea which one's going to work for you. And it could change based on your ability to execute, right? People say, Ben, what do you believe in high or low volume? And the answer is for who, right? If someone's really good at contracting muscle, what, they're going to obviously need substantially less volume because yeah. they're, they're actually subjecting their body to more work. Yeah. If someone is, is very poor at contracting muscle, well, they need, may, may need greater volume and greater frequency to elicit the same minimal response. Mm. So, uh, I mean, there's so many levels, but that's the foundational principle that everybody misses, you know? Mm. So before all those listeners out there dive into the next program of, of thinking about how many sets, reps, exercises, volume, load, all these things, well, Stop and like, can you tell yourself definitively at every inch of every rep that the muscle I'm trying to train is actually doing the work? Because I guarantee you can't. Mm. And what are, oh, because I mean, you've, you've had so much experience. What are some examples of uh, the best exercises for you? Exercises sure. that you found are like, I really like this for this, I really like this for this. Yeah. So, um, the ones I find honestly work best for me, typically work best for everybody, regardless of their mechanics. It's just a matter of manipulating the setup a little bit. Okay. Um, so, you know, people with long femurs, long legs will typically go, I can't build my quads. Yeah. Well, yes, you can. You yeah. just need to learn how to set up for the squat to do it for you. Mm. Uh, so just- That's me. So, I mean, I, I actually haven't, I would say my legs have responded decently, but I have long femurs. So squatting's so, always been a pain in the ass. So I'm, I'm Literally curious. a pain in the ass, right? Yeah. So it's like, I get a sore back, I get sore glutes, but yeah. my knees, and my knees kind of hurt my, my, you know, yeah. So the simple answer is, man, and I'll speak at a high level because you'll understand this and most of your listeners will understand it while trying to make it as simple as possible. The way you squat, has everything to do with the proportion between your upper leg and lower leg. Right. So if you're someone who has a really long femur, logically, as you descend into a squat, your glute has to go further back because if it didn't, you'd fall over. Right. So if I stand up straight and I'm standing, just standing normally, my center of mass is balanced through the middle of my foot. So center of mass, you, could, you guys can envision, if I'm standing straight, is balanced through the middle of my foot, my knee, my hip, my shoulder. Right. As I take any of those joints away from that center of mass, the further the joint goes away, the more the muscles that cross that joint have to work. So someone like yourself with long femurs, as you descend into a squat, that hip goes way back because of the length. Now I'm going to challenge that muscle tremendously where the quad may not go or the knee may not go as far forward right. because of just mechanics. Right. So your body has to be balanced. So you're inevitably going to build tremendous glutes and probably get lower back pain because you're going way outside of what your body can handle at your hip. So if we can manipulate the ratio of femur to lower leg uh, length, 
well, now I can change the mechanics of the squat. Well, how do I do that? And it's by as simple as adding something under your heel. Like you may need to add as much as four inches under your heel to mm. balance out the differential between those two lengths. But mm. if I can add a heel elevation, now all of a sudden, gosh, I can squat with my torso being vertical yep. and actually get a tremendous amount of challenge to my quad as well while not giving a tremendous amount of... So people go, what about my knees? People run into knee problems when they're doing that stuff with poor pelvic stability. Mm. So that's another thing we, you know, people should understand is typically knee problems are a result of either poor foot mechanics or poor hip stability mechanics. So you know, most people, the knee is this hinge joint that kind of exists between these two complex joints. So knee is relatively simple. The thing with the place where it runs into problems is if it's trying to perform the function of the hip or the foot, so the hinge should, should function like a hinge. And if we start to, if we limit the rotation of the hip or the, the foot, the knee needs to pick up some of that rotational uh, component that the hip is lacking or the foot is lacking. And that's where people run into knee problems. Mm. So if you have a stable pelvis. And what foot function, just so people listening, what are you, what are you referring to exactly there? Well, walking gait, right? You should be landing with a heel strike, rolling the outside of your foot, and then have this natural pronation. So the pronation is also this rotation that happens in your knee joint. Mm. So it's just this natural function of, you know, most, some people are flat-footed. Thereby, if you're flat-footed, you're going to lack pronation. You're going to be more in the slap put position. You're going to mm. be internally rotated mm. at the hip. So all these things, if you're internally rotated at the hip, you're going to lack hip external rotation, which is going to prevent you from going all the way down in the squat. You yep. do go down in the squat, you're going to get back pain and knee pain. Yep. Like, just that's the way the body works. So realizing that that doesn't mean you can't squat. That means you need to learn, okay, well, how can I compensate for these things that I lack or how can I improve them as I go? Yep. And, and I'm not attached to having to squat, but I'm attached to having to take this muscle through its full range challenge. Right. So you asked some of my favorite exercises, um, you know, specific to legs. And just to chime in real quick, so just out of personal experience, so uh, what I've, I've had, I wouldn't say knee problems, but, but achy knees here and there, but mm -hmm. something that helped uh, was squatting in shoes with an elevated heel, uh, squat shoes, proper shoes, um, which I've been doing for a while, but I found that out a long time ago. Like this really makes a difference for me. There's no question. Well, and it allows you to get more vertical. Yeah. That's it. And if you added something that was even bigger than that one inch that's allowed or yeah. one and a quarter inch, whatever it is. Yeah. If you added a two or a three inch, you'd feel even better. Interesting. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't tried going higher. I just like bought, you know, squat shoes a long time ago and was like, well, this is, uh, I'm never squatting without these again because this feels way better. Yeah. And then um, I was lacking external rotation in my right, which is where I was, uh, my knee was, was bothering me sometimes. I have like a little daily routine of uh, 10 minutes or so of yoga stretches that I do focusing just on for me. So it was, I needed more internal rotation on my left, more external on my right. And, um, so I was doing yoga classes for a couple months and I just found the, okay, these are the stretches that work really well for me. And also for, for my SI joint on the left, uh, that will act up. It's just, I don't know. I have imbalance. Do you have a shoulder body. thing as well? On uh, my right side, I've had it before. I've had some bicep tensors. Yeah, so those things are all correlated, right? So you, you have a, a, a tilt of your pelvis. So right. if one side is lacking internal, one side is lacking external, it tells you one hip is forward yep. and the other one's back. Yep. And usually that'll manifest in the opposite shoulder. Yeah. But I've been doing now for, I don't know, six or seven months at this point, a uh, daily routine of 10 minutes or so of stretches. And um, it has made a big difference in my squatting in particular, because I have a lot more, I'd say probably 50% more external rotation in my right now. Wow. And, and it's uh, it was actually weird to, to feel like the squat felt different. I was feeling it in different muscles mm -hmm. on my right side. That, that's just my experience of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and everyone's got imbalances, right? Like yeah. everyone's screwed up at something. Yeah. It's just learning how to, how to fix it. It's yeah. learning how to like train around it, right? Yeah. Or you know, train around it while you improve the yep. skill at the same time. Yep, so yep. that segues perfectly into what I'm about to say. Like, I think exercise can be framed in a really simple way. You have exercise that you're really good at that should be used for output. Like, I actually want to work really, really hard on this. I don't have to think about it. I have unconscious competence. I want to train hard with this exercise. You know, we all have those body parts. Like, gosh, this just feels really good. I don't have to think about it. I don't know why. Mm. I just know that I can work hard on this. And we have the other ones I'm not so good at. So yep. I call those skill acquisition. And I think there should be a good balance in everyone's workout day to day between exercises that are output based and ones that are skill acquisition based. So you ask what exercises I thought are the best. Well, the answer is depends on who. For right? you, for you. For me, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm always trying to develop the skill of certain things. Like squatting is a shitty exercise for most people because they don't have the skill. Mm. You have to master the skill. And if you want to master the skill of anything, how often do you have to do it? Often, right? You right. want to do it more than once a week. Right. Probably three times a week minimum. And you don't necessarily need to do it to max effort, yeah. but you got to do it. You got to practice that skill. So squatting can be a tremendous exercise for people, but I'm not attached to like, oh, that's the best exercise. So the way I frame this is skill acquisition exercises are often things that are internally stabilized. So squat requires me to stabilize my 
trunk, my spine, my scapula, my pelvis, my feet, like all these things need to be stabilized by my muscles, mm. externally or internally stabilized. And then I have these other exercises that are externally stabilized or artificially stabilized, meaning it's I can shove into a machine. Yep. So typically the output-based exercises are going to be the ones that are artificially stabilized. Sure. Like if, if I can do a bench pr- or a bicep curl and yeah. I have a bench to push into with, with my arm, I can yeah. probably produce more output in the bicep because I don't have to worry about creating stability. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I only want to do those exercises because I still want to do the quote unquote functional stuff that allows me to use my internal stabilization to actually control my body. So I like to have this nice balance of things that are skill acquisition and output based, which is uh, you know internal external stabilization. So hack squats, like for if it's the legs, I, I would have a hard time with any on the, on the sled. Or are you talking about the barbell? Hack squat with a, with a sled. Okay. Yeah. So if someone's trying to build muscle, I'd have, I would have a hard time. With anyone giving me a an argument against hack squats, yeah, I've always liked hack squats. It, it's, I mean, it's so much better than a leg press because you're gonna get more range of motion yeah. just because of your relative hip position. Yeah, I really. And like it's it. so much better than the squat because you get more stability. I'd have a hard time for someone saying, "Hey, you know, I think squats are better." It may be better for some people, yeah. but even that, I would doubt. Mm. Um, you know, the, the most tremendous amount of of growth came for me when I was, mm. you know, adamantly doing hack squats every yeah. weekend. Just I was doing them for a, a while. My when I was in Florida, the gym had a. a, a yeah. I don't know if it's a rare piece of equipment, but that was the first gym I'd worked out in. That at least where I had, I guess in the past, a long time ago, I didn't train legs for shit. So maybe I never noticed it, but that was the first gym since I actually started training properly that uh, had it, and I was doing it consistently i really liked it unfortunately the gym i go to now doesn't have one but right. yeah i think it's just it's basically a squat yeah. that adds more artificial pelvic stability yeah. because if you can't squat well if you're having a hard time with feeling your knees it's just stability yeah. like you lack if you lack stability you don't build muscle yeah. so stability governs muscular contraction if your brain senses instability it down regulates muscular contraction right. so for you to actually benefit from squatting you have to be so good at the skill that you don't have to think about the skill anymore i yeah. could just do this up and down now i have to focus all of my focus on stability mm. That's a completely different thing for most people, right? Whereas if I go into hack squat, I don't think about stability. I can just think about yep. output. Yep. It just goes straight to like similar to like press in that regard, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah. just a different range of motion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a great example. And like so looking at exercises that way, like is this internally stabilized or externally stabilized? And do I need to learn the skill of internal stabilization? Because that's a skill. Yeah. Both of which can benefit, but realizing that you want to challenge muscles in every workout. Like, and if you can't stabilize a muscle internally because you lack the skill, well then you gotta use the ones that are artificially stabilized. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about uh let's say chest and back? What were to what were your go-tos sure um just because i know what people listening are going to be wondering for yeah, other, other muscle groups I, well I, i'm a very unique case because my rib cage is substantially bigger than most people mm. uh, as far as my angle of my sternal angle it's funny i see this in my kids too my kids are five and six and uh, they have this very steep they're very small but they have this very steep sternal angle so it's not just a matter of my rib cage being big it's just this particular genetic angle so if i lay into a flat Which for people to visualize it's like pushing the chest out right yeah it's exactly natural, pointing shoulders yeah, back chest yeah. goes up <laughs> Um, so if I lay into a flat bench press, that position that my sternum is in is, as, as people can imagine, is almost to where my sternum now is kind of pointing toward yeah. the sky. Yeah. It's kind of almost, almost, almost like a decline for a person with a more flat. That's the exact yeah. comparison. So for someone to do the equivalent of what I'm doing on a flat, they're going to have to do a 30 to 40 degree decline. Yeah. So when someone writes in a program, do a flat bench press. Yeah. Well, who's doing it? Because if I'm doing it, I'm going to get a big chest. If you're doing it, maybe not you, but person at home, sure. you may just get sore shoulders yeah. and not get any pec development. Or this is a, a bit of a paradigm shift for most people. A flat bench press for probably 90% of the people is the best upper chest exercise. Like people are like, oh, you want to train your upper chest, you got to do incline. The answer is no, you don't. For most people, if you have a flat rib cage and you're doing an incline chest, you're training your shoulders mm. and you probably get sore shoulders because of it. Mm. Um, so I'd say for about 80 to 90% of my clients, their upper chest training is done on a flat bench, which sounds backwards. But if, if we get a chance to go to the gym this weekend, we'll show you. And it's just yeah. a little like watching where the load is being placed and then watching how the muscle contracts. And if you just watch the insertion of the muscle, pull closer to the origin. Well, where does it go? Does it go closer to the upper chest? Does it go closer to the mid chest or closer to the lower chest? And mm. if you just observe, mm. you go, oh, well, gosh, that is 100% upper chest. There's no lower chest involved for mm. most people. Um, so if they want to train the lower chest, you got to learn how to manipulate the angle. So for me, it was a flat bench press. Decline seldom, and incline still works for me, whereas incline for most people doesn't work. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, back exercises. Um, I think a reverse grip 
pull down with a relatively wide handle is, and this is Interesting. subjective and, and, and personal, but I think it's the best. Mm. God, I haven't done reverse, reverse grip in a long time. Yeah. So for the, I haven't, old, even, for, I haven't even thought of it. If we're talking lat, yeah. I think it's the best exercise because maybe not for rhomboid, I mean, not for trap, but like if we're talking lat, because what I've realized in my you know, 20 years now of training, the thing that people miss. So as I briefly said earlier, if, you're, if I'm trying to train my chest, I need to maintain a position of retraction to get maximum chest stimulation. Right. The same is true with lat, except in the inverse. So I need to maintain a position of protraction, which is effectively reaching my shoulder forward and away from me. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily my, my arm that goes with it, but it's a shoulder, this position of shoulder protraction. And if I can maintain that protraction while I go through shoulder extension, which is, you know, for people sitting at home, if you're sitting up straight and you reach your arm out in front of you, you really try to reach and get your shoulder to stretch out as possible, feel that stretch, and then drive your elbow down, not yep. back, yep. down, that's yep. shoulder extension. So most people, when they train back, they think back. So they're pulling the weight toward them, and you don't want to do that. If you're training a lat, objectively, you want to be training, you're trying to get your elbow as far away from you as you can and create the biggest arc possible. Interesting. So it's, there's never a back movement if you're training your lat. It ends up being back and around, but it's yeah. not the thought process of being back. So as soon as I pull back, then it's being a rhomboid and a trap exercise. Yep. Um, so as soon as those scapula so for people back, listening, if they've ever done like lat push downs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where you're like standing, like a straight arm. Yeah, you it's get the it. exact same movement. Yeah. It should be the exact same yeah. movement. Yeah. Um, so like a straight arm pull down with your yeah. Yeah, with your arm. Yeah. So that's where people go wrong. That's why a lot of people lack lats, including myself. For a lot of years, I was wrong with that, and I was like, well, if I want to get the lat, you know, as short as possible, because objectively, an exercise our objective should be to get the muscle as short as possible. As most contracted as possible. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, oh, I want to pull my shoulder back. Well, you, the truth is, yes, you do need to pull it back to get it fully shortened. But by pulling it back too early, you completely lose the contraction of the lat. Mm -hmm. So you end up relying on the forearm flexors yep. and the rhomboids and traps. Yep. So I, mean, I ran into that myself where I had a, had a fairly strong back, but I was like, why are my lats just, they're just shit. Like, yeah. but I have, nobody but knows how to I do I can it. pull, I mean, I could pull, especially given my body weight. I mean, I haven't, uh, since, since having kids, my sleep has been funky. And so I haven't been pushing heavy weight weights as much now as I used to in the past, but right. I was like, I'm pretty strong on, in all of my pulls. You right. would think I would have more lats, but it's, but a, it, it's a retraction. Pull. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then I, when I started doing, I mean, I started doing a lot of standing, uh, lat pull down or push down and actually, you know, whichever of those names is correct. And that helped. Um, yeah. and I started doing it a few times a week. Yeah. And, and honestly, that's one of the greatest things for shoulder health too. Cause so many people live in this kind of like constant shrugged state where the shoulders yeah. are up around their ears. That's a stress state. That's, but the opposite of that is pulling them down, which is the function of the lat. So if we yeah. learn to pull them down and kind of back, yeah. um, we can actually improve the shoulder integrity as well. So yeah. those are exercises. So a reverse awesome. grip, well, reverse grip pull down was one of your favorite. Yeah. As, when, when done properly. Yeah. 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 Um, you'd mentioned earlier about stress and how it affects muscle building. I think it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. An article actually just went up, I uh, just saw it a few days ago uh, over at Greg Knuckles' site, Stronger by Science. Uh, it was written by Greg, actually. I haven't read it yet. I saved it to my Insta paper because in typical Greg Knuckles fashion, it's very long, mm -hmm. but I want to go through it. I wanted to hear your thoughts, though, on, sure. on that because it's something that isn't spoken much about. And I myself, have, <laughs> ha it should be, I agree. Yeah. And I uh, have experienced it now firsthand mm -hmm. over the last year and a half or so. Um, I mentioned my sleep being, you know, I, I don't think when, when I would tell that to people, they'd be like, oh, oh, didn't you just have a, you know, a kid was, you know, your second kid? Yeah, but that's not why I think actually is more related to just stress mostly coming from stuff at work and which is now coming to an end internal stuff whatever yeah. and even though i wouldn't say that it's manifesting psychologically all that dramatically like i, I don't have symptoms of anxiety or, or depression right. or i seem to be pretty much like you know just doing my thing if i only sleep three hours one night yeah i'm not having a great day the next day but i still just do my thing sure. you know what i mean but it definitely impacted my training there's no question i noticed and now that i'm i'm starting to sleep better stress levels objectively have kind of come down the situation things that were causing problems are now resolving magically i start sleeping better magically my workouts in the gym i start i'm feeling like myself again like yeah. i can progress this week it doesn't feel every workout isn't it's so fucking heavy that i'm just struggling to maintain my numbers you know right. what i mean right so stress is a massive thing that i think everyone should be considering and it's you know we talked about writing a book and it's one of the six foundations of a lean and muscular physique i believe is learning how to manage stress and change your perspective of stress and learn some coping mechanisms right Stress can be viewed in a really, really simple way, uh, looking at the autonomic nervous system, right? So we've got a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. Can you just branch. define those quickly? Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. Um, so sympathetic is going to be uh, fight or flight. So we're going to be stress. Like anything that causes the smallest amount of stress is going to be a sympathetic stimulus. And then we've got the parasympathetic branch, which is rest and digest, calming us down. Mm -hmm. And ideally, we want to have a balance between those two. And like We're going to have stresses in our day. We're meant to be stressed, but we, we want to have things that balance that out. So a simple way for people to do it is create a chart. I do this with all 
my coaching clients is like, you know, I want you to write down all the things today that were a sympathetic stimulus. So it could be, I don't know, you got a bill, you got to fight with your wife, you, you um, I don't know, your boss yelled at you, you got cut off in the car, like, you, I don't know, your workout is a sympathetic yeah. stress for most people. You look at anything and like, oh, make this list. And it, for most people, it's going to be long. And parasympathetic stimuli are things that are going to balance that out. And I could talk about that in a minute. But um, so the more sympathetic stress you have and you go add a workout on top of that, your body's just living in this, this constant state of stress, overwhelm, anxiety, and adrenaline. And those things are literally the kill switch for muscle building, right? So mm. um, if I don't- Why is that? I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but why is that? Well, so cortisol is going to promote fat storage and lower testosterone. Right. So if my cortisol is always elevated- Also muscle breakdown, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Cortisol is not bad. Like people hear it and they think it's bad. It's not bad. It, it should be in this natural rhythm, right? It should be high in the morning, low in the evening. And it's a useful thing. Like yeah. evolutionary. To acute stressors you want. I mean, it, it, yeah. kicks, it kicks your energy systems in. Exactly. And, yeah. um, but the problem is we live with way too much stress. And there's so many things that are stressors that you don't realize mm -hmm. in your environment, in your life. There's so many things that are happening. But um, so people are living with this massive amount of sympathetic stress. And they go in the gym and their only solution to working hard is I'm going to work hard today. I'm going to yeah. cr hashtag crush it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With no, specific, <laughs> no days off. Yeah, with no specific objective of like, you should think about if my objective is to build muscle, lose fat. My objective in training then should be to create the greatest amount of muscular stimulus with the least amount of systemic stress. Mm. So I don't want to have to do tons of volume. I don't have to do tons of work. I want to do the smallest amount to, to elicit this, this muscular building response. Minimum and, effective dose type of exactly yeah. and and progressive because yeah. your body will respond to a novel stimulus. It has sure. to be progressive, which is why it needs to be standardized and then, and hopefully documented. This is the big paradigm shift in, in exercises. Everyone just wants to go and work hard. And I say if if your only solution to progress is working hard, you're fucked because at some point you're going to work so hard that your stress is going to override the stimulus. No matter yeah. how good you are at exercise, your 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 stress the amount of work is going to override the stimulus. So you got to learn how to train first and like standardize the stimulus. And then objectively, how, how little can I do to get this muscular response? And that's really the simplicity of it. And so if we want to start looking at these parasympathetic things to balance your body out, it's really the stuff that you would know. It's connecting with nature. It's getting outside and maybe grounding and looking at the sun and getting some sun on your body. And uh, it's breathing. It's meditation. It's creating strong relationships, like creating community. It's very simple stuff like that. You yeah. Know? Um, like love, you know, be grateful. Yeah. Um, those things are very calming to your nervous system. They're stimulating to the parasympathetic branch. Um, and that's from my perspective, the biggest mistake I made throughout my bodybuilding career. Cause I was that guy who came from a, a family of lazy, overweight alcoholics. Mm. And I had a badge of honor around, I'm never going to be called lazy. I'm going to outwork everybody. If it means I die in the gym, like I'm going to, I'm going to crush you first. I'll never quit. And that was my badge of honor and I didn't want to lose that. But at the same time, it was the dumbest thing I ever did because if I have to outwork everybody, I like the idea of outworking everybody because yeah. at some point it's a competition. But the biggest mistake I made was doing too much and thinking, you know, as an athlete, you ever tell an athlete to do less, what's it going to tell you? It's like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm doing more, yeah. if anything. Yeah. As a, that's, that's almost as a challenge to do more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you're saying I can't and do that more. That was my Achilles heel, man. That was like, I was always overstressed and under recovered. And mm -hmm. had I had somebody said, hey, man, like, take a day off. Cause he realized, and after a contest, when you took a couple of days off, you looked so much better. Mm. You know, you st spend some time in bed. It's not just about spending time in bed. It's like, you know, I, I read into all my programs and I read into parasympathetic days, mm. meaning like, what are you doing today? Go get a massage, go to the beach, like go for a walk outside, get some sunshine, listen to some calming music, like no sympathetic arousal, right? Yep. I, ideally. And I write that into everyone's program because yep. it, like you have to schedule it. Cause if you don't schedule it with people, they're not going to do it, especially yep. type A personalities. Totally. So I usually write in it now an hour in the morning of parasympathetic or even 30 minutes. Uh, usually I try to do an hour before bed and we can talk about that too. The, the idea of like, uh, I've built this framework Pre -sleep routine. on the night. Yeah. How to do that. And then, uh, you know, once one day a week, there's no sympathetic stress. Like you're not allowed to go for a run. You're not allowed to go for a walk. You can go for a walk. You're not allowed to train. Yeah. Uh, ideally like no caffeine, yeah. no blue lights. Yeah. Like I recommend very, something very similar in my yeah. books, just as a, a standard. I mean, I try not to get too prescriptive about it, but the same concept is yeah, no vigorous vig uh, physical activity. Yeah. No roller coasters. Yeah. No horror just take movies. It easy. Yeah, man. As much as that sounds silly, like it makes a difference. I know. So what's your pre-sleep uh, routine? You, you mentioned owning the night. Yeah. Two hours eliminating all blue light. I think that has been the biggest. Which means no screens, no TV. Yeah, that's been the biggest difference maker for me is minimum two hours. And that's, yeah, television, 
cell phone. What do you do instead? Computer. Read. Or play with my children. Yeah. Like the idea of connecting with human beings, yeah. what a novel concept. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I often try to bring my team over. Like I try to bring some people over once a week from my, my, my team and, you know, we have dinner and we connect and we laugh and, and there's no cell phones. Like That probably makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, just feeling a sense of community, you know, yeah. it makes them feel better. It makes me feel better. Everybody has a positive attitude, bringing kids over to play with my kids and, and if it's not them, it's, you know, it's my wife or it's, it's whoever, right? But like learn how to connect with people. And if you can't connect, read, like challenge your mind and you'll find it's easier to fall asleep. Your sleep is better. Yep. It's all framed around that. So, you know, only the night includes, um, like I said, light. It also includes minimizing food intake two hours before bed. It includes, you know, the sleep environment. So obviously you understand getting rid of EMS, getting cold, rid of bullet, cold, cold. Yeah. yeah. Um, all those things, you know, yeah. so it's all this framing that I'm creating in the book. And the book is framed around six foundations of a lean and muscular physique. And uh, these things that I've kind of decided over the last 20 years are probably the most important. You know, I started off with a list of 12 or 15. It was like all these things that I thought were somewhat important. And I was able to narrow it down because obviously being able to focus on things is important. Uh, but sleep and stress are both on that list because if you don't change those, the likelihood of you, no matter how hard you work, you get it. Yep. <laughs> like you're not going to, I've lived it. I've lived yeah, it the last, the last year and a half. I, I, I've told guys that, you know, at the office, I was like, you know, in a sense, I, I feel like I was a little bit lucky that I had a stretch there of four years or so where I, I could just, I could push myself hard in the gym and then work 12 to 14 hours, work right up to the point of going to bed. I would right. go to bed at 1145 and I would wake up at 630 every day before my alarm. My alarm was 645 wake up myself every day yeah. just and it, i was i was a robot in that sense so, and i was able to make really good progress all of your your sympathetic stimulus were probably minimized outside of work and and, and the gym right because if that's all you got that's pretty good like if there's not a whole bunch of other things like lack of sleep and kids and, and yeah. like even the kids screaming you know this is a dad even if they're crying because they're hungry or because they poop their pants that's still stress totally you, like you're still getting a massive amount of sympathetic arousal and, yep. and if you're living in there that's st that state all the time you're not sleeping well you're not recovering well like yep. your body can't grow Yep. And this is what people mistake, right? Everyone thinks the first thing you ask somebody, the first thing they respond when they say, hey man, like, why don't you think you have the body you want? What's the first thing everybody says? Mm -hmm. Nutrition. Yeah. It's not nutrition. It, nutrition's a big mm -hmm. thing, but it's all these other things that are playing a role. Like I think everyone would agree. If you're sleeping really well and you're not stressed, your margin for error on your nutrition is way better. If you're training really well, your margin for error on your nutrition is way greater, right? Like I can eat a little more freely if I'm yeah. training really well and I'm less stressed. Yeah. But if I have high amounts of stress, now my nutrition matters way, way more because yeah. I have to make sure that I can't get any, I can't get five calories more than my macros. I'm getting <laughs> fat. Yeah. All right. But if I'm sleeping well, if I'm not stressed, all these things, okay, well now I can eat a little extra. My body's actually going to grow. It's going to build muscle rather than adding fat. Wow. What a concept. So I think that's the biggest mistake people make in their life is like, oh yeah, it's my nutrition. It's not your nutrition. It's this, you know, some of the parts. And I think training is the foundation of all of it. Yeah. Uh, I've been very conscious of my nutrition, not so much from a body composition standpoint, but more just from a, cause uh, again, uh, so it's been about a year, year and a half with my sleep going, you know, good, bad, good, bad. And, but I don't want to, I, I was okay with skipping some workouts here and there. Like if it really wasn't a good night of sleep, mm -hmm. I figured this is just not going to be productive. Yep. And so just not train as much as I enjoy it, but uh, I skip a day. But also uh, what I wasn't willing to do is just let all of my routines go fall right. out. Like I, right. I still, so I wake up early at five thirty six or so uh, late, late would be six thirty, And then I, I like to read. So I have an infrared sauna. So I go in there for 30 to 45, maybe 60 minutes, depending on what time I woke up yep. and I, and I read and, uh, and then I'm to the gym. So if I, even if I'm skipping the gym, if I'm starting a little bit later, Stimulus. I still want to do that. So yeah. I don't want to, I want to do my work. I'm not willing to let everything go to shit. Yep. You know what I mean? And so uh, I was very conscious of my nutrition just to support Sure. The training that I could do and support the other, like, I do want to be productive. I, I, even though my body might like me to just sit around, I no, I'm not doing that. Right. And so for me, I know that that helped. Uh, sure. Because just by, just by how I felt. It may have been a stress. Yeah. Yeah. You because know, people don't realize that nutrition can be a stress too, whether True. it's a psychological stress, like, oh shit, I'm missing my meals or I'm not eating really well, but it can also be a physiological stress. Like I'm eating crappy foods. Yeah. So Nutrition is very important. Like, I don't want to underplay it. Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, it's not the end all and be all that people believe it is because you could have your nutrition perfect mm. and still get fat mm. if you're stressed and you're not sleeping well. I don't care who talks about macros because mm. macros is a big piece. But if you introduce those other stressors in there, your ability to digest and absorb those foods changes yeah. based on hormonal profiles. You know, yeah. So there's a lot of considerations there that people aren't making. And I think it's easier than they realize if you give them a framework around which to, to frame it. So these six foundations, like I say. I like it. You mentioned um, transitioning in in terms of your identity. Like yeah. 
because you're you're a bodybuilder and that that was you for yeah. 20 plus years and now how, how has that been it's stepping been, away from that and then man. and then are you at a point where now you you're feeling like you're you're, trying, you're finding a new identity or you're there or what's that like so for 20 years i was you know the better part of 20 years i was single-mindedly focused on this goal, like I said, and that was who I was and that was everything I did. And uh, maybe I shouldn't say that's who I was, but that's what I did. Yeah. Well, kind of by definition then, right? I think we probably are in many ways, what what we spend our most of our time doing yeah. is a reflection of who we are, whether we, I think that's just reality. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then when, when I decided to remove that, it's still, it's only been two years, it's still a uh, struggle to mm. find your exact, cause I'm a very goal oriented guy like yourself, yeah, man. Like same. I gotta have a very clear cut objective and I don't, I feel like I'm kind of meandering through life and I'm like doing a lot of shit, got my hands in, in a lot of things, got a lot of irons in the fire, but I want that one thing that like I can cut away everything else. So I haven't found it yet. And so it's an interesting transition, man. But I tell you the beauty of it for me is it's been, it's so much less of an external journey and so much more of an internal journey. So I think at every point in, in everyone's life is there's particularly men, I, I can't speak for women, but for men, most men have this, innate desire to accumulate things, right? Yeah. Whether it be money or in my case, muscle or whatever it is. And you're, you're, cause you believe you're going to accumulate these things and it's going to make you significant. It's going to make you feel better about yourself. You're going to transcend the proverbial mountain, but you get to the top of the mountain and whatever it is, and you realize it's empty and hollow and you're lonely. You were and, climbing the wrong mountain. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you get there and you're like, Oh shit, it's not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So you start looking around and you start climbing back down the mountain and, and you're less concerned with these material things. And, and for me, it was this muscle thing. And I start realizing that, okay, well, what is it? And you know, for most people growing up, and I think it's part of the journey of being a human is like, there's this need to uh, accumulate external things, um, this external journey. And then when you transcend the external journey and hopefully everybody does in their life, it becomes an internal journey. Like, you realize that the real um, journey in life is finding yourself and finding, uh, you know, kind of peeling away the layers of the onion of this person that you think you are, or the person that you've become based on the scenarios you put yourself into and actually finding who you really are inside. And there's a lot of value in that, right? It's like, you know, thinking about the, the reality that the person that you are now, it's not necessarily who you are inside. It's the person you've become as a result of reacting and responding to the situations you've been subjected to. So, you know, you wanted to receive love as a child. So you acted a certain way to receive more love. You didn't want to re receive angry parents or, or, you know, some type of negative response. So you didn't do certain things because you knew your parents were going to react a certain way. And then you start asking yourself, well, is that me? And that's kind of the journey now is trying to identify uh, the things that I really believe are my inner essence mm. and remove the things that are contrived. It starts for me with forgiveness, uh, forgiveness for the people that have maybe uh, done things to me that I believe to be negative uh, or have framed my life in some way that's made it harder for me, quote unquote harder, you know, the story you tell yourself. Uh, but this is a really cool journey, man, where you start just looking back and, and unraveling the layers of the onion and going, why am I the person I am? And why do these things set me off? And why am I angry about this? And why am I happy about that? And questioning everything you thought you know about who you are in your life. And that's really where I am. And, uh, you know, I think once you find that inner essence, you can find what brings you joy. You can find who you are and you can truly be yourself with the people around you. And uh, I would have never realized these things had I had not gone through what I did as a bodybuilder, had I not had my amazing children. And what does that, what does that mean for you in terms of goals now? Because being a very goal engineer, I can relate to that. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm just curious as to. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's been the hardest thing for me, and I'm, I'm, I haven't been too transparent with this, but I think I should be. After having left professional bodybuilding, where I was in the highest stage in the world competing in the Mr. Olympia contest, that's a very... Um, blatant external goal yeah. and it's very motivating to go you know i'm going against the best guys in the world i want to be the best yeah and then now transcending that and not having an external goal physically yeah. it's very hard to train at the same level without having a specific goal so my, my training has kind of been much less challenging yeah. much less goal it's there's yeah. nothing there it's yeah. like I'm i can relate some, to that i mean yeah. i was never on your level but even just previously where i was i was just more numbers oriented yeah. like hey i would like to hit you know these benchmarks and work toward that but then with uh, stress and things where I've now the last year, year and a half, my training been, I've been, I felt like I'm just trying to keep up. I'm just trying to not fall backward. Yeah. And uh, I can relate to that where it's, it is a bit less enjoyable. I still do it and I still have good workouts, but it's different. Right. I, I don't even know if it's less enjoyable. I actually think I enjoy it more, but don't work as hard because I don't have an objective. Like yeah. previously when I was competing, 
every day needed to be the best workout of my life. Yeah. Otherwise, I was down on myself, right? Like, yeah. I failed. Now, I actually get to do what I want to do. I have no attachment to the outcome. And I'm like, oh, I actually like doing this. But I'm not working as hard because I just like, well, I don't need to. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have any reason to. Yeah. And I'm trying to find it, but maybe I don't need to. You know, maybe maybe unconsciously, I just need to let it go and do what I want to do and have fun and look good and feel good. And But it's it's challenging, man, especially to eat well all the time. I do eat well all the time, but like, it's not regimented, like you say. Mm because I don't have a reason to mm -hmm. goals wise. I love the idea. And you know, you know, I relate on this man is leaving the world a better place. And I have this amazing platform where people follow me and listen to what I say. And I want to leave the world a better place. And I think I do that by leading by example and teaching people that it's okay to be this big muscular human and still treat people with love and respect and kindness and, and lead this next generation of young males and females in the fitness industry by being a great parent, by mm -hmm. being a great man, by being a person of integrity, by being a person of discipline and show all these values that uh, I have inside that some people are afraid, I think, to let show, right? Like it's okay to be a loving guy. It's okay to be a caring and thoughtful person and still have this big masculine persona. So I think for me, it's, there's, there's something in there. And again, I don't know exactly what it is, but you know, the more people I can get to um, love their body. I had this conversation with somebody yesterday. Most people train their frame their training around anger and fear and like running away from something. But why not turn it into love and running towards something like love your body, connect with your body, feel your body, get to know your body. Yeah. And I want to try to create that message for people. Like it doesn't have to be about I'm pissed off at somebody. Therefore I have to go work out harder. It's like, it doesn't have to be, I go to the gym because I have to, mm. you don't have to do anything, right? Let's, we get to. So how do we learn to frame, create that framing of positive reinforcement? And then you're, you're literally, every time you can track muscle, you're, you're bringing love into your body rather than bring hate into your body. And that's kind of an abstract thing to, for people to think about. But now if I'm, if I, every time I go to the gym, I'm framing it around, I hate this. I hate this person. I don't want to do this. Or, or maybe, or maybe even just, uh, I mean, I know just, of course, I mean, you know, this working with a lot of people uh, where it's a more of a self-criticism thing. Like maybe, maybe it's not even about other people. It's just like, I look like shit or, you know what I mean? Like, that's why I'm doing this. Well, I want so to stop what, hating what I see in the mirror. That was exactly what I was saying. It's like, maybe they're taking that even deeper with their training. Because if I'm framing my exercise around, I hate myself or I hate this exercise or yeah. I hate being here. Well, now every time I look at my body, that unconscious thought of hate comes in. Like, I didn't like that work. Like, I didn't do good enough today. How about flipping it around and doing like, man, I did well today. Like being, being grateful for that. Maybe that's an opportunity for you to anchor love and joy and achievement accomplishment and do it more and more every time because hey i feel good about this hell yeah like let's celebrate that set we did great on that set yeah that shit's important man as yeah. much as it sounds kind of woo woo and convoluted like no man like it, uh, so i do this with with all my clients is I, let, I try to get them to remember a time where they had a sense of achievement or accomplishment and every time they're having a bad day i'm like hey remember that time when you had this happen like, yeah. And like, go there in your mind for a second. And now let's go do our set. So we're anchoring our positive emotions rather than these negative uh, angst, anger, and have to type emotions. And I think it's a big piece. And if we can start having people anchor happiness and joy in training and then thereby loving themselves, all of a sudden we made the world a better place. Because if I love myself, how can I be mean to other people? Yeah. Like it all starts there, you yeah. know? And I think that for, for me, that's the opportunity that I have in front of me is to be kind of the the voice for that, maybe the lighthouse in the storm of people going, stop anchoring anger in your training and start anchoring love for yourself so that now we can love the people around us and love our neighbor and love our family and our spouse and our children. And there's so much to be learned in there, I think. And that's kind of where I'm trying to hash that out. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I, I can relate to that. Even just being appreciative yes. of my body yes. and what I can do with it and yeah. how, you know, good it can feel sometimes. And yeah. that I've been, that has just kind of struck me sometimes where I'm like, thank you body for, Dude, you're for working awesome, well. Right. Yeah. Like, you're fucking <laughs> awesome. You're in great shape. You're a successful business guy. You're a great husband and dad. Like wake up and go, fuck yeah, I'm awesome, man. And it sounds like, <laughs> I think that's, go, a, I think that's okay. As long as you're going, Hey, other people can be awesome too. And other yeah, people are awesome. Yeah. It's not about holding yourself. If above you can people. tell yourself you're awesome, maybe, and you actually mean it not from an egocentric way. Like yeah. I actually love this body, man. Like good for me. I, I'm actually stuck with what I said I was going to do today. Yeah. Yes. I had the discipline to, to, and the self character or the self uh, confidence to fall through this, this stuff. You could, maybe then you could take that and give it to somebody else because it's hard, man. It's really hard to go to somebody and go, dude, you're awesome and actually mean it because you talk from a place of fear. Yeah. Uh, and if you learn to love yourself, truly love yourself, it's so much easier to go up to someone and give them a truly loving hug or go, go like, Mike, you're awesome. You know, I think that's a powerful place, man. And, and for so many years, I was very insecure in my body at 318 pounds. So I wasn't comfortable enough going up to someone and going, 
man, I, I did actually, yeah. but way more so now. Like, gosh, I know what you're going through, man. I know what it took to get that body. You're awesome, dude. And people take it from me now and they're like, wow, like that guy was one of the best in the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. That means a lot. So yeah. when I say it and I mean it, like it's special, you know, and I think that may be an opportunity for me to help, you know, lift the energy of the earth is just like telling people when I actually mean it, when they actually deserve it and they're actually falling through with things like, dude, you're fucking awesome and meaning it. Yeah. Maybe a cool thing to spread some joy and love, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think you're awesome too, by the way. Thanks, and that's man. something that uh, it actually resonates with me because I've been aware of, I don't give compliments to very many people. And it's not because I think poorly of them. I think sometimes some people will get that impression and I can understand them outside looking sure. in, but it, it's not that at all. I don't know why I, I just, and, and I never, I'm not, I don't go fishing for compliments either. So at least I can say that I'm not, a, I'm not right. a hypocrite, right. but, uh, I like that because it's, it's, I've had to remind myself, even like at the office with my guys, I've had to be aware of that. And I've even put it on like my list of things yeah. to keep in mind, like give compliments, man. Dude, don't, being a leader is a hard thing. It's uh, probably the, the, the hardest thing I'm going through right now in my, oh, yeah. in my transition. Yeah. It's a hard thing, man, because as a bodybuilder, I don't have to lead anybody. I yeah. just be by myself. And not, if I don't want to talk enough to talk. Yeah. But now you got to be like, you have to be the guy that people want to follow. Totally. You know, and that's um, different. It's new. Like you, you have to be on your game all the time and that's yep. mentally challenging, physically challenging, but I love it, man. I love the idea of having this amazing opportunity to lead a new generation of awesome humans. And that's what my framing of my podcast, right? Mm. It's like, you know, this new generation of awesome humans and a new generation could be up to 65 year old men or women. Like totally. You, if you're trying to change, change your life, if you're trying to become the best version of yourself, well, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to just like become the catalyst for creating an awesome version of you. Do you feel like you, uh, I mean, I feel like this, it seems like you have a desire to just, to just do more, to have a bigger impact. And I mean, sometimes I, I myself feel like, what am I doing? Like I'm, I'm almost like I'm wasting my time. I should be, yeah. I should be doing more. I should yeah. be, if I try to assess myself and say, I clearly have certain skills and I could do, I could do things with these skills. And am I really putting these to the highest and best use? Right. You know what I mean? Am I really operating at the level that I could be or should be operating at in, in Jordan? Petersonian terms, am I really bearing the appropriate amount of burden yes. or am I just kind of cruising? Because I, I can't say that my life is hard. I mean, I can't. Yeah, like, I feel the same. And I think you're, you're, you're becoming a good leader and that's maybe where your growth lies, right? It's like, how do you become the best leader so that those people become followers of you, you know, not in a bad way, but follow yeah, yeah. you to spread your message. And that's how you create a greater impact, right? Because then you have thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who are relying on you, you're bearing the burden. Um, because they're relying on you to be on your game all the time, to be this great inspirational leader. That's a huge burden, man. Does that again, feel like a burden for you? No, I mean, it, 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 when we talk, you're just using your term. Yeah, term no, totally, hundred percent. I don't think it feels like, like yeah. a burden at all. I, yeah, because me, me neither. I thrive, man. Yeah, I love that. I'm all about responsibility, and yeah, I love the opportunity to help people. Mm. I love it, man. I don't take any stress of that. Like, you know, I've got a gym and I've got a very small number of members, like a hundred members who have this exclusive facility. And I literally try to have my finger in everyone's life. And I'm yeah. like, hey, man, my kid, how can I help you, man? Like, how's your, how's your training? How's your stress? How's your sleep? What can I do to help you? And that's a pretty awesome place to be. And then, you know, that kind of transcends to this tribe of people online that, uh, look to me for some type of assistance in living their greatest life, living their awesomeness. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, dude, I love it. I think it's great. And like you, I think it's a beautiful thing that you don't think it's hard because perception is a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if right now in your life, you're like, oh man, I'm so burdened. This is so much. Yeah, it's so stressful. There, there's no more. That's yeah. it. And that's the same thing with training is like, how hard are you working? Oh, I'm working hard. No, you're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah. Trust me. You're not working hard. Come, yeah. sp come spend an hour with me. We'll see, we'll see if you're working hard. You're not fucking working hard. Nobody, yeah. nobody works hard. Like yeah. compare yourself to Navy SEALs, compare yourself to, you're not working hard. You're, you're doing a workout. Yeah. Um, so don't hashtag. That was something that annoyed me about this, this sleep issue where I go, okay, so psychologically I feel like I feel okay, but physiologically, what is this? So this means yeah. that this is the amount of burden that my body, like, and, and this is where it taps out. And it's just that that's how it manifests is yeah. in sleep. I mean, it's nice to see that it's, it's resolving. And I guess a little lesson I've taken away from it is to not let problems fester. I'm not that person usually. 
you know, there's a situation in particular that I don't want to go into too much right now just because of the circumstances, but that was a festering problem that, and, and the reason why I allowed it to persist for so long is I actually truly wanted to help. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't that I wanted to run away from it. You're smiling because we were living a very parallel life. Okay. So, <laughs> so then you can relate to what I'm saying. Very much so. Right. And, uh, but you get into that place and you know, I'm sure you've been there where you're like, okay, you don't know what to do anymore. And then come up with a new plan of, you know, you still want it to work. You still want it to, you're still, you're still yeah. trying to be like positive about it and not let it bring you down. But that, that builds, uh, I mean, the stress of it builds, right? Yeah. Because it becomes then a bigger problem, a bigger problem. And so eventually it was like, okay, now I'm done with this. And from that point forward, stress levels noticeably came down. Yeah. And for me, the same thing, man. It's, but my problem, you know, if there is, if it is a problem is that I care about people. So rather than being, okay, I'm just going to chop this and let it go. Yeah. hundred percent. You're like, oh man, how can we make this better? hundred like, percent. I can't, I actually want you to like, you know, anyways, yeah. we, we won't get into details, but yeah, see, yeah. Like, if you care about people, it's very hard to like, you know, I always see the best in people, man. It's my blessing and my curse, right? Mm. It's like, no matter what you're doing right now, I'm always going to, but I know deep down in there, there's somebody who's, you know, a great person. They just need some love and some attention and some something, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah. That's sometimes a blessing. And a curse. See, I'm not naturally like that, but I was like consciously being that way. Cause yeah. I know that's the right way to be. Well, prior to my bodybuilding career, I was never like that. Yeah. But after this this kind of you know awakening that I'm going through now, I think that I really try to see the world through other people's eyes. Mm. And if I can see the world through your eyes, I can be more empathetic. Sure. And, and historically, I'm not at all an empathetic person. Probably yeah. the least. Right. right. Like yeah. my, my highly disagreeable. If you've ever taken a dude, my response is shut the fuck test. up and fix it. Yeah. Like don't complain about something. That's always been my response. Like yeah. don't feel sorry for yourself. Get off your fucking ass and do it. Yeah. But now it's like, oh well, maybe we can help them a little bit, and maybe I can be the guide, and maybe I can you know assist and help them get over this hump and. And I don't know the answer. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's kind of the default now for now. And well, I think it really, the results, right. Or what works is what's right in my opinion. So yeah. in some people that works and some people right. you can just say, stop complaining, fix it. You know what to do. Yeah. But, and, and that's right for that. And some people that does not work. Right. Bedros is someone who is here with us this weekend. And uh, he's a guy you want to talk to about that. Cause he's, he's been my business coach and he uh, frames everything in his business around never allowing for 1% divergence. So if there's someone who gets 1% out of line, you tap them back in line nice and uh, firmly. Mm. And if they get it in line again, you chop them out. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's it. And I need that, right? Yeah. It's like, if you really want to run a successful business that actually makes a difference in this world, absolutely, you can't allow for 1% divergence. And because, you know, the idea is you diverge 1% now, six months from now, where, yep. you, where are you, right? You're way over here in the tangent and then you've created a big turmoil, which is probably what it sounds like you and I have both allowed to happen. Yep. Uh, and it, dude, it's been so much bigger than it needs to be. Like it could have just been dealt with right away and stupidity, ignorance, love, what do you, whatever you want to call it for me? I was like, I was trying to be caring and try to take care of people, but it ends up coming back and kicking you in the ass. Yeah. Well, this is a great talk. Thanks Mike. Yeah. Well, where can people find you and what, what, where's your hub? Yeah. Well, I'm building my hub right now. Okay. So since having retired from bodybuilding, I'm, I've kind of shifted my business quite a bit. So the hub will be muscleintelligence.com. Cool. They can also find me at MI40 if they look up MI40, uh, MI40nation.com and BenPakulski.com. And I've also got the podcast, which uh, is currently MuscleExpert.com, or sorry, yeah, MuscleExpert and MuscleExpert.com, or will be changing very soon to something that's a little more all-encompassing, like I relate. This is not just about muscle. It's about so many other things. So, yeah, yeah, evolving your brand. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Appreciate yeah. you, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, buddy. Hey there, it's Mike again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it interesting and helpful. And if you did and don't mind doing me a favor, then please do give this video a like and leave a comment down below. Not only do I like to hear from everybody and I jump in and reply to as many comments as I can, it also helps other people find their way to the show and learn how to build their best bodies ever too. And of course, if you wanna be notified when the next episode goes live, then just subscribe to my channel and you won't miss out on any of the new content. Lastly, if you didn't like something about the show, then definitely shoot me an email at mike at musclelife.com and share your thoughts on how you think it could be better. I read everything myself and I'm always looking for constructive feedback, so please do reach out. Thanks again for listening to the episode and I hope to hear from you soon. And lastly, this episode is brought to you by me. <laughs> Seriously though, I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in. So instead, I'm going to just quickly tell you about something of mine. Specifically, my fitness book for men, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. 
Now this book has sold over 350,000 copies in the last several years and helped thousands and thousands of guys build their best bodies ever, which is why it currently has over 3,100 reviews on Amazon with a four and a half star average. So if you wanna know the biggest lies and myths that are keeping you from achieving the lean, muscular, strong, and healthy body that you truly desire, and if you wanna learn the simple science of building the ultimate male body, then you want to read Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, which you can find on all major online retailers like Amazon, Audible, iTunes, Kobo, and Google Play. Now, speaking of Audible, I should also mention that you can get the audiobook 100% free when you sign up for an Audible account, which I highly recommend that you do if you're not currently listening to audiobooks. I love them myself because they let me make the time that I spend doing stuff like commuting, prepping food, walking my dog, and so forth, so much more valuable and productive. So if you want to take Audible up on this offer and get my book for free, then simply go to www.bitly, B-I-T-L-Y.com slash free BLS. And that will take you to Audible. And then you just click the sign up today and save button, create your account, and voila, you get to listen to Bigger, Leaner, Stronger for free.